they're like, all right, let's leave early, go home over uh, Kat's friend Zena and her boyfriend, who we just met that day. We're coming back to our place. They ran to the grocery store to get stuff to make nachos. We were making nachos, and her boyfriend was helping me prepare them and was getting the pit out of the avocado. You know, you, you know, like turn it, and when you went to twist it, the avocado pit split unexpectedly and cut down into his finger down to the bone and he had to go get two stitches like i could see the bone it oh. was he's like oh that's not good and i was like ah! <laughs> like i need an adult this, that looks awful <laughs> I, he must have missed him, because I could clearly see bone. <laughs> okay. Well, I've got our topics here. Should we get started? Yeah. Should we? What order are we going in the in the email? The yeah wages for Facebook. Unless you feel student. differently, I don't have strong preference. No, uh, it doesn't make a difference to me. So what I think I'd like to start with, actually, is even just, like, a little talk about um, what we're doing and what direction we're going in. Yeah. So uh, the first season and really the second season of Marxism today, in fact, I, this is so bad, It's it's been two years since I did anything. One. One year? One year and a couple months since your last post. Well, but on that the blog. post had been months before the previous last post. And that, and yeah, a lot of, those, there were a lot of like blog posts, but not like actual podcast episodes okay. either. Yeah, I think the last podcast episode was the Why I Joined the DSA. And yeah, it probably was about two years ago. Yeah, and there was like, Probably like six months of no activity before that. It's been a long time, needless yeah. to say. I guess is the point that we're driving at. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to actually go back and look at it. And I have like two things that I feel comfortable calling seasons that why I joined the DSA post is technically, well, I labeled it as the first episode of season three. So I was trying to figure out what season this should be. And I think I'm going to call it season three. Okay. Because uh, I feel like I really can't just let there be one episode in season three and be like, that's the whole season. Well, it's, you know, it's it's the tying it in with the DSA. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, if this, our reboot of the podcast, what uh, is driving us here today, sitting here, is that we've decided to restart the podcast as a project for DSA. Yay! <laughs> so it kind of ties in, yeah, exactly. Um, but, of course, uh, because I've decided to commit to this, like, season format where I label what season and what episode of each season each thing is, I have to decide where to start with this one. And this, is, this was my thought, to call it Season 3, Episode 2. Okay. And maybe that makes sense. Do you have a new on this? chapter? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's weird because it's this is a total re like reimagining of the podcast. We're going in an entirely different direction that we'll talk about in a minute here, but it's going to be different. Yes. And so maybe it's worth saying this is episode three, season one, and saying that other one was actually like I don't know, just a random bonus floater episode, like retroactively renaming that one. I don't know. S season three long preview. Yeah. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. Like <laughs> like <laughs> some some very foreshadowing. Yeah, I feel like there's got to be some. Because this happens with other things, too, right? Where they'll put out some form of media in between seasons. Yeah. Is there a term for that? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway. 
I guess we'll call this season three, episode one. Um, we'll figure out later what to call that or old video. episode big one. Big or one, the okay. big one. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it were like if we would have done like A, B, and C, I could have used like capital A or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. I guess let's talk about the direction this is going in. Uh, so up till now, the videos have mainly been me explaining something. Like I'd take oftentimes like kind of uh, just a piece of Marxist theory and explaining it. There was the section on uh, a strange labor where I did like read aloud from the text sort of thing. And there were a couple of like hints of the direction that we're looking at going in. Yeah. Um, I should... <laughs> I oh. should look and see what episodes those were. Oh, we don't need to reference the no, particular okay, episodes. I mean, there was the one where, where Thad sat in. Thad and, and... Was Justin there? No, uh, Matt was there. Oh, um, yeah. But he was... Very quiet. Audio background decoration. Y- yeah. Audio eye candy. <laughs> Well, yeah, so so that one was kind of a discussion, um, more on basic theory stuff, but still still more discussion-based. And then there was kind of the long-form interview with Kristen, which was much later. Yeah, which was, uh, what what is Marxism? What is it to be a Marxist, sort of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that one, I think it was really like we decided the, the topic after the discussion. Yeah. Was, was kind of how that one went. Um, which maybe, I don't know, the, I, the, the way we're thinking of moving forward. So the, I guess let's, let's start talking about that. Uh, so, so I'll be here, but I'm joined by Tony. I was going to say, should we do introductions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so Red Wagner as usual and, and Tony is joining me. Hi. <laughs> um, and, and we're going to be sort of co-hosts for, uh, the podcast moving forward. Uh, possibly joined by a few others, maybe off and on. We'll, we'll kind of see, yeah, as 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 recurring guests. And and we're also go- the the format's going to be a little bit different too, because we're we're going to discuss. We'll choose uh, kind of certain topics to guide the discussion, but then you know, there's no scripting or anything like that, uh, like I used to do with with. Um, the older versions, it was, you know, at least bulleted pointed out, if not scripted out sometimes. This is going to be not really rehearsed, not written out. It's just kind of a discussion. It's the, it, but that's a whole, uh, genre of podcasting, right? Like since I had made my podcast, I realized my podcast didn't seem to really fit in with a lot of the really like good podcasts that are out there. Like, Podcasts tend to be longer. The, yeah. Um, it's the, the, the two dudes talking, I believe is what CPG Grey calls it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if you're familiar with podcasts, it's the two dudes talking <laughs> genre, uh, which fits well because we're two dudes and we're going to talk. Although it's awfully sexist. Yeah. It's very, oh, yeah. It's, and then I, oh, good boy. Already getting off topic, but no, I am. Um, go for it. I wonder then, I mean, you know, obviously traditional media is, has a uh, sexist bias, as does most of the workforce, but the podcasting, the internet, does that also have a strong sexist bias in there? Is it more, is it a male-dominated thing, podcasting? I, I'm, okay, so obviously this is just a, a speculation, because no, we're, we're not academics or researchers in here. But I'm going to go ahead and put my money on yes, that there is a huge gendered bias. I, and and I was thinking that same thing. Yeah, I think you're right. But I also feel like I need to go home and do a Google search of <laughs> popular po- <laughs> Or I wonder, I'd say popular podcasts, ones that do like the best, I wonder. Or, I don't know, I, I bet in all categories, I bet there's just less... And then I wonder why that is, because it's really a medium that is not, it doesn't have as many of the traditional barriers as other things do. Yeah. I mean, socially it mm-hmm. does, but. Well, that, see, that's, I was thinking the same thing. Like, it's so 
easy to just set up a podcast. Like, you need something that records a piece of software that can record, that, that can be found for free. You know, like, it's, there's not a lot of barrier to entry. The, the, the means of production to a podcast are, are not super high. Like, yeah. if you're, if you're, I don't know, employed in the first world, you probably can do it. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, not necessarily, but there's, there's, it's not anything like, like, tradi- traditional media, right? It's like, not like you need to get hired as a news anchor and have a degree in communication or something, or in journalism or something. Like, you can just sit down and set it up for the most part. Yeah, like a blog. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, this, and so my thought was, well, if the access to it is so open, why is it that there aren't, uh, aren't really very female, very many female voices out there in podcast world? And I actually, I think it's this. I think it boils down mainly to the, the value that society places on different people's opinions. That because we're brought up in a world where the opinions of men are valued and displayed prominently in traditional media and and so forth and so on, uh, guys feel like it's totally normal that they would record something and possibly someone out there would want to listen to what they have to say. Whereas I don't think that women are socialized in that exact same way. Yeah, I, yeah, I would, I would say that sounds probably pretty right, cause, yeah, I mean, it, it'd have to be a social thing, being the barrier to entry. Or, not an actual barrier, but the, oh, yeah, well, I guess like, it is like, a like barrier. A mental barrier yeah. or something, yeah. A mental societal block. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in the same way that you see, like, um, you know, like, they'll, they'll talk about female politicians and how, like, their rate at winning, I think, is, uh, supposedly better than men, but, but they run so less often. Oh. Uh, and, and I think that, that kind of plays into the same thing, where it's like, you, you don't feel like going out there and taking a chance in this relatively male-dominated field. Unless you feel really comfortable or really sure of yourself or, or whatever. Right. And you get hyper scrutinized. Um, oh, like yeah. you, you're looking at Hillary Clinton. Oh, she had a blood clot. Does that mean she has permanent brain damage? And oh, she's a woman. She must be emotional despite the fact that you have people like Glenn Beck, thankfully no longer on Fox News, but on his own crazy channel, bawling. John Boehner bawling. It's, you know, uh-huh. you get all these people crying about stuff who are men, but that's just, you know, that's, it's okay. It's men with a weak moment, whereas women are always weak and occasionally have a strong moment is, is what the, the hegemonic messaging is for that. And with, with Hillary Clinton, you really have to have some ideological blinders on because, you know, nothing about her really comes off as particularly emotional if you're just looking at her as a person. <laughs> yeah, she is not... Well, I think part of that is, you know, the whole, oh, look, I have to publicly sit around while my husband gets scrutinized for having an affair. Like, she put on a pretty steely and solid exterior for that. Oh, yeah. Like, that... And I think that's sort of what she's, you know, then going into politics herself. She sort of kept that up, and yeah, and she basically doesn't have a choice because any little thing, no matter what, is going to be oh, oh, she can't do it because she has a vagina. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's essentially yeah. their argument: is she has a vagina, and we all know that. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea where that comes from. It's just straight up sexism. <laughs> so, uh, despite the sexism of the term, two dudes talking is essentially the, the format that we're looking at moving forward. We'll see where it goes. I think we're pretty much open to whatever, but that's probably where we're going to end up going. 
Yeah, although I'm wondering if we're going to have to make sure we get some female guests then oh, after that. Yeah, and yeah, after that whole thing. It would <laughs> after be... that whole thing, I'm like, oh, yeah. we, we need to make I, sure we get some female guests. Yeah, Thad might join us and Justin might join us. Mm, both men. Yep. Kristen was wonderful on the one she's been on. Yeah. If yeah. she'd be available. I wonder. I think her and her husband are very busy right now with their new baby, but at some point in time. Understandably so. <laughs> Okay, well, our, well, should we dive into our first topic for this, this episode? Our, sure. We're, I, I wrote the, I titled it Wages for Facebook, which, which is, I'm not exactly sure. I, I, I thought it was a movement, but now I think maybe it's just an art installation, but. It's, I think it, my impression is it's an art installation that's trying to inspire I think it's more realistic than thinking it'll inspire a movement, but inspire consciousness. I guess it's an art installation then. <laughs> <laughs> with with aspirations to be something more. Yeah. But uh so I think we should talk a little bit about kind of what it is to to start off with or or what what the general thrust of it is. Um so wages for Facebook is I guess it's a, it's an art installation with with uh um, talk, talking about Facebook and, and really, I mean, I feel like maybe the choice Facebook was kind of a, like a marketing choice, but I want to expand this more to just internet activity in general. Yeah. It, it says on the wages for Facebook thing, if you get through the long, long scroll at the bottom, it says that it is generally applicable to most web and internet. So, yeah. Because this is the general idea. It is that people go on the web and do activity. And that activity that they do actually has value. Oftentimes in, you know, in the, in, for, I guess some examples from Facebook is one, like they can use the pictures that you post on Facebook. So you're like actually giving them material. Uh, as well as like creating a profile of a person, which is extremely valuable for like targeted marketing. Now, like targeted marketing is, I don't know, however many times more effective than regular marketing. And so the, the fact that you can have a profile of someone's likes and dislikes, like down to what they, um, you know, press like on for their friends or what, whatever. Someone told me this too. I don't know if this was uh, who told me this. But someone was telling me that Facebook remembers and records a message that you typed, but then, like, deleted and never sent. They actually keep the record of what you typed. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. Which, which I think is just wonderful because it's, uh, like, wonderful in an awful way. I mean, it's, it's amazing that they keep it because it means they have a statistic on you, which is, the thing you did chose not to say. Does that mean that Facebook, uh, in another, uh, money grabbing scheme can start blackmailing people? Hey, remember when you were drunk and you almost told that person who was a friend of yours that you hate them and you, oh. like, pooped in their bath, in their, in their <laughs> towel or something, you know, and yeah. you blamed it on their dog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah I mean, I'm a, it's scary if you think it, from a blackmailing perspective. It's like if someone had any single. You, I'll say this: if you give me anyone's total internet activity, there's just got to be a way to make that person look like an awful person. Well, well, like the NSA. Um, what they were one of the uh, things that had come out in the last. I don't know when, 12 months, you know, with the Edward Snowden stuff, is that the NSA was collecting porn viewing habits of um, uh, Islamic people who they considered to be possibly, potentially a threat, or speaking out against uh, America's imperialist wars. They, uh, they collected their porn viewing habits as a potential blackmail for them. So... Wow. It is not, yeah, it's it is not, not theoretical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. No, I mean, it's a level of, yeah, it's a level of knowledge about a person that, like, governments that we think of totalitarian in the past would have loved to have gotten their hands on. You know, there, 
there is no way like the USSR or whatever could have uh gotten as much information on people as Facebook can do today. Yeah, it's it's really just it's a wonder I and I know the US has tried to set up sort of dummy social networks in other countries to create dissent um with uh, them. I think they were doing it in Cuba. They had like a, a Twitter type thing hmm. that they had set up to try and spread, like promote, have, well, like have the tweets that show up most, or it wasn't Twitter, but you know, the messages that show up most often on people's feeds were that of popular political dissidents. And, you know, they'd feed in their own as other stuff. Um, but really, I mean, the social media stuff, I mean, if you, if we just look at how an imperialist or, like, the U.S. government could use that if, I mean, they have access to all that stuff, basically, if they want it. So, if they are looking for you, they know where you check in. They know, you know, oh, look, 4 o'clock every day he goes and gets a cup of coffee or hits the gym because he checks in here. And, oh, look yeah. at all the people he knows and all the places he lived. Well, we can narrow down where they might try and hide then because these are the places that are familiar. And it's all voluntarily given information. Yeah. And, I mean, that also is wonderful for t ad targeting as well, which is, you know, what they use it for. But. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean... The, yeah, cause that's the real, like, there's, there's like an intelligence benefit there that we're talking about, which is like the particularly scary part and blackmailing and all that. But the, I think the massive value of it, yeah, is targeted advertising, probably, oh, I mean, yeah. if I had to oh, venture yeah. a guess. And, um, what's interesting is so there's, there's like this amount of social work that is being done. By collecting all of this information, but the bulk of the work is really done by the users of the of the site. So, like the, it's not like Facebook is doing a ton of work to find out who I am. I'm doing the work that lets them just simply collect it. Same thing with Google, because you know Google will make a profile on you based on your searches and things like that. So, like, the, there's this all of this information out there. That we just by our simple usage of the net are providing, and what wages for Facebook? Because wages for Facebook, I love it because it's a provocative title, but I also kind of hate it because the the problem with a provocative title is you're going to attract people that love provocative titles, but you're also going to take a bunch of people that will take things in a very literal face value way and just write it off immediately because I, uh, you know and I don't know what the what the uh, what the creator of the art installation would say maybe they would take like this very rudimentary path where like facebook gives you you know 3 cents for every post you make and a, a fraction of a cent for every like that you do like i would not take that stance on this because I think, you know, that, that one, because um, I don't think that it's necessarily like a quid pro quo thing. Like, you know, th then like I could go on to my Facebook account and, I don't know, just click a bunch of stuff and get a couple of like some extra cash or whatever. I don't think that's really how it should work. Right. But, and there are companies and people that do that too around the world. There are click farms that are, there are people who are paid to click and like, and they just like a bunch of stuff. And anybody who has a Twitter account probably has, I mean, I think my Twitter, I have like four people following me, and I think three of the four are, you know, just these <laughs> click farming things, and the other one's like my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, people do get paid, but not the, not the people who, yeah, yeah, because that's like fake value, right? Like yeah. that's actually the opposite of value is someone just randomly clicking like. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, but I, I guess I would say, okay, if we as a society, as a populace are logging on and doing, creating something that is valuable. And I, I guess this is why. This is also why the title was Wages for Facebook, because it's a correlation to an earlier campaign from the 70s called Wages for Housework, 
which I, d- I don't know that anyone is paid for, you know, wages for doing housework, but, uh, now, I mean, th- sure, like maids or something, but like not, not in the sense of you're a housewife and you get wages for housework or, or a house husband, I guess. There's plenty of house husbands today. Um, but it, it, what it does is it draws attention to the fact that there is an act of social reproduction going on. There is, uh, a value being created and being appropriated that is not being compensated. And that, I think, is great. It's, like, wonderful because it gets to the core of, like, a Marxist critique of something, right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's the analysis of who creates the surplus and who appropriates the surplus. Uh, and at the, and what's interesting is all of, uh, us as people using the web are creating, uh, surplus value. We're creating something of value that the owners of these, these tools that we use, like Google, like Facebook, are able to appropriate, uh, entirely. Oh, yeah. And I think that, you know, don't get me wrong, I, th- it's not like I expect Facebook or Google to, and all their employees to work for free and, and never receive any compensation. But I think the, the question, the, the question comes up that people should be compensated for the amount that they contribute. Uh, and, and so, like, I think the people at those institutions should be, you know, paid fairly and pay, paid well for the work that they do. I'm sure there's lots of like programming and stuff that goes into what they need to create. But there's also a certain amount of the value that they have appropriated that was created by the users. Yeah. Well, they they make the framework in which the actual value happens. So the value they contribute is there, but it's it would have, it has no value unless it has the users. The users are really what gives the value. Cause if it's just me, I'm the only person on Facebook, I'm never using Facebook. Cause that's, you know, nonsense. It only has value through the use of the users. Because if all your friends aren't on Facebook, then why are you on Facebook? No, that, that's, that's entirely true. But, uh, but I don't think you're, I would, let me ask you this. Cause I, I would say that both pieces need to be there. Like, obviously, there needs to be a platform oh, yeah. for it to happen on. Uh, so there's, like, the whoever programs that platform is creating value as well. Well, how about this? It's They're creating value with the platform, but until it is used by people, there is no socially necessary labor that goes into it. It's once the people use it, then it becomes a socially necessary commodity, you know, to try and appropriate. Because because if you're just making a social network that nobody's using, you're bas- you're essentially making a product no one wants, which mean you know then yeah, you're not okay, actually yeah. creating I see, value. I, I see where you're going. Like in it, the same it, way that like it doesn't exactly making work. a mud pie is not socially necessary labor. Right. It it's not completely analogous, but I. I think in thinking of it sort of in terms like that is, I guess, where I'm trying to get at it from. No, no, that makes sense. Uh, but see, so I guess what I would say is there's, there's got to be some, something that those funds could be directed for, right? And, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the, actually, I think there's a lot of ways that this can, this di- discussion can happen. Like, I think, Oftentimes the gut reaction, and I'm, I've had this reaction a lot, is that this sort of profiling and targeted marketing and so on is wrong and bad. Like it's, it's creepy and it feels like a violation. But now maybe it's like because if you live with something long enough, you're eventually going to be okay with it. I don't have those same reactions anymore, but now I think but we are all still creating this value and not getting anything from it. Oh, like yeah. the the owners of these social media are are just getting it. But like what if we decided that in some way that that kind of information, that kind of profiling information was a public good. And so 
Facebook for their providing a framework gets that gets a certain cut of of the revenues brought on by that public good, but uh, anyone that you know anyone that decides to use that for their marketing uh, has to pay into it. So that's you know how that generates uh, actual like dollars and cents, and but then those dollars and cents can go to a fund for I don't know something. There's there's got to be something that would benefit the the user community. Uh, free internet access for everyone. That yeah. would be a wonderful one. Yeah, to like expand broadband to un- unpopulated area- areas, rural areas. Yeah, National provide, Wi-Fi network. Yeah, to provide Wi-Fi in heavily concentrated areas so, th- so that it reaches a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, th- in, a, in many ways, the internet really should be a public good just based on how often it is getting used for everything, like how you need to use it for certain things, things that are becoming, like, expected. Well, and the United Nations has declared uh, internet access to the internet a basic human right. Oh, really? Yeah. So you can really say that, um, yeah, I, I, you can really argue if, not the U.S. pays attention to the U.N. when they want, <laughs> don't want to, but argue that it's actually immoral and illegal according to the United Nations to not be providing internet for everybody. So therefore that that we have an obligation to be providing that and look, here's a nice mechanism already there that we can use to pay for it. Yep. Or at least partially pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Although I I'm sure that the UN is probably thinking like you need to have like a library nearby that you could like access the internet from or something no, like they that. They did that in a response to uh, internet service providers in, I believe it's Australia and the UK setting up blacklists for pirating websites. Um, so in response to like the Pirate Bay and all this stuff. A lot of these countries, particularly Australia, is uh, pretty hardcore about this, have set up uh, national internet blacklists where if you Google search the Pirate Bay, nothing will come up because it's blacklisted. Wow. And they're nonsensical because they're super easy to get around. And But, like, it's at the internet sure. service provider level. So it's not even Google's doing it. It's your, you know, like, uh, in this area, charter. Mm-hmm. Or Comcast and Time Warner, <sighs> Comcast Time Warner. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's that it's at that level, which is also scary because it's obviously a form of censorship, and obviously, like anything like that, it is woefully misappropriated. I don't remember the statistic for how many things were on there that were perfectly legal and fine, mm. but they just had a problem with that they censored. Sure. Oh yeah. Actually, I love. I totally would support uh, a campaign to provide free internet at at whatever level. Maybe it wouldn't be very comprehensive at first, but at some level, oh yeah. Well, based on the revenues generated by internet use and activity. Yeah. Well, and even talking about like the libraries, uh, I I work at a public library, and in order to use the internet at the public library I work at, you need a library card, which just means basically you have to be a Wisconsin resident, which isn't that very... You have to be able to prove that you're a resident, which can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but normally it's not too bad. But also, you have to have fines not in excess of $20, so a lot of people are turned away from internet use because of oh. excessive fines. Wow. Which is not something that other library, the Madison libraries, uh, you can still get on the internet for. So thankfully the largest section of populations who would be using it in the area are able to get it without that. But there are definitely some libraries that have more restrictive access and that would be I think if we're talking about like a national drive, that would be one of the first things to do is, you know, institutions. I mean, I don't think there are any libraries that don't have internet computers for people, but to make sure that those are all free and open to people. Yeah. Because the library is supposed to be a, a democratic institution for, uh, you know, for everyone. It's one of the most socialist organizations that exists in the United States. Yeah. Or government. 
sensations. So, yeah, but I mean, just Wi-Fi. Yeah, not necessarily in the terms of uh, worker control. No, but, uh, very much not in the terms of worker control. But, but but for in the terms of the 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 consumer's perspective. Yeah. In the sense that we all pitch in for this thing, and then you can go there and get as many books as you want. You know. Yeah, which is why it would be a wonderful place to start with something else like that, like internet. Yeah, v- yeah, very much tapping into this feel of a post scarcity society too. Like, I guess there's a list, a wait list for very popular items, but like it's it's not like you probably don't have much of a limit for how many books people can check out. Oh. For this area, it's 100 items. So, One, yeah, see, like, it's not really a limit. Yeah, like, and I'm sure, like, what percent of the population does that limit ever come into play for? Like, it's essentially uh, in infinite for most slightly people. Slightly over a decade of working in libraries, I've seen it happen four times. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. that's how common it is. Yeah. So, I mean, effectively, for the vast majority of people, like, for, for, it's almost a statistically insignificant number for people out of the number of people that are using them. Yeah. The, so, for virtually everyone, there's an unlimited amount of books that you can get from the library. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing. Like, what other commodity can you say that for? Where it's like, there's this place where you can get it for free and you can get as much as you want. Except, Confusingly and counterintuitively, the place where it's the hardest is the digital collections that we keep. Because, you know, with people using ebooks and stuff like that, uh, we have it so that people can check out ebooks and audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And there is an artificial limit placed on them because obviously yeah. they can instantly distribute infinite numbers of that essentially to anybody who wants it. Yep. And most items we have a one or two person, or two copy at a time limit. So even though it's a digital thing, they can distribute easily without any problem yeah. at essentially next to no cost and no pro- You still have to wait on hold, wait for it to come. And even worse, if you read, you get them for like, I think two weeks. If you read that book in two days, the next person doesn't get it to the end of the two weeks. You can't, like, return a digital thing early. <laughs> so the the publishers, in order to allow them to do that, uh, put an artificial limit on the thing that should be the easiest to get to the post-scarcity point. Yeah, yeah, you actually have to do extra work to enforce the the fake scarcity yeah. on, on the item. Yeah. We, we, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's, so it's, it's like clearly not a technological problem at this no. point. No. In fact, with the, the, it's pro- an art- the technological problem at this point is how to enforce the outdo- outdated social mode upon technology that has outgrown it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, especially in a neoliberal America where they're all about leave the markets alone. To very, very actively manipulate a market in that way to force artificial scarcity yeah. upon a good that does not need it. It's like just the price of ebooks. Why is an ebook two bucks cheaper than a hard copy of a book? That makes no sense because you cut out all of the printing costs and all of that, which is a good chunk of it. I mean, obviously, you still pay the writer, the I, editor, yeah. all the other, you know. I, you know what, though? We are so good at com- commodity production that I'm not sure how much the actual printing of a book is in its amount of cost. I would guess that it's very low. Like, just like most products, the actual production of the product is extremely low compared to its sale price because of all the other, like, administrative and advertising and just you know the design budget and everything like that the actual production of the thing is oftentimes very small yeah and so i'd be curious to know about the books yeah well i mean the ebook thing though i love when ebooks go on sale because it's not like oh we have all these ebooks that we gotta we just gotta make more room for these 
things in our ebook warehouse. We gotta get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Well, this is as low as we could have sold them for if we wanted to. So when, you know, ebooks drop down to like a buck, it's like, okay, so you could have sold me this book for a dollar. Instead, you wanted 20 for no reason. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's the same, like, yeah. It's the same thing with, uh, with a lot of stuff. Like uh, a friend was telling me today, or, uh, not today, earlier though, about um, how internet providers, it's really hard market to get into because right. adding another person to your service as an internet provider is so cheap to do and so easy to do um, that it costs almost nothing. But you need like everyone paying in to like meet your like regular costs. So like the upfront, like you just need to get a lot of people in the pool and then you're good, and then just adding more people to the pool is gravy after that. Uh, so it's it's a very similar thing, I think, with the books, where it's like, okay, now that the book has been written, we're going to try to get as much money for it as we can, but once you've sold to everyone that'll pay 15 bucks for that book, you might as well start selling to people that'll pay 10 bucks for that book, because there's probably a little bit of a market in there where that's just extra money, that's just gravy, even yeah. though they get it for less. And you you might as well just keep on going down. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if the people actually do that. It seems like they never drop beyond a certain point. Not for... Well, not for if we're talking telecoms or internet. <laughs> um, That's true, They yeah. They always have their promotional prices, which, as I discovered, if you threaten to just up and... I threatened to drop my internet the other day. Uh-huh. I, instead of trying to bargain with them, I just said, nope, cancel it. And they went, wouldn't you love this higher speed for a lower cost than you're paying now? And I'm like, sure, but why, you know, <laughs> yeah, if you threatened to leave, that's yeah. why. But I mean, if it's all gravy, what a socially responsible, uh, internet corp ISP would do, which is a funny phrase, um, would be <laughs> to just constantly, the more people get on it, the, you know, instead of saying, oh, you sign a friend up, you get $50 uh-huh. up, it's you get 10 friends up, we'll drop you guys down 10 cents. A penny for every person. Let's get more people on here so that it's, you know, we're still making our, you know, 2%, 3% profit or whatever they want. But, you know, the price is at a level where that it lowers it for everyone. Obviously, that's never going to happen with a private corporation. Yeah, you know where you're going with that. Where you're going is you have, like, a city utility that is that. That just figures out how much they need to charge everyone in order to like cover their operating costs, and th- and that's kind of it. There's no other like, there's no like monkey business with like you have to call in and complain to get a lower rate or whatever. It's like same rate for everyone, but the you know the they're not going to charge more than what they need to keep it all going. And if it's one utility for a, a large area, city or whatever. You could probably get pretty cheap rates. In fact, there's this there's this whole scandal I read. Um, I mean, not scandal. I don't know if you'd call it a scandal, but about how the uh, about how in Europe internet is so much better, like way faster and so much cheaper. Like it's usually like a quarter as expensive, like or or some fraction, you know, um, and and sometimes twice as fast. You know that's that's very interesting, and I, to to me because I think they they look at it more in the way that you and I are looking at it. Well, and I think part of it too for uh, Europe, and I might be totally off with this. I believe they actually uh, have part of it is because there's actual competition, whereas uh-huh. we have artificial monopoly. Because I believe yeah. the government there has put in all the lines, the wires, so it's. They leave it to the corporations to, you know, fight for customers to go over the common lines. Sure. Which is, I mean, you should just do away with the corporations, but. (laughs) So the lines here are privately held then? Yes, I believe so. Or, I mean, I think so. I believe. Yeah, because that's why you have, you know, here the options are if you want uh, cable internet, you get charter. And That's if you right. want DSL, I think it's Frontier now, and then there's Satellite, which is miserable to do it. <laughs> um, although, speaking of community ones, um, community utilities, the uh, city of Sun Prairie, 
is looking at a proposal to do a com- uh, have the public utility do a fiber optic network. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah. You um, mentioned that. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, that, that could be... be exciting. Yeah, it'd be exciting, but it also is, you know, a pit potential pitfall, whereas you were talking about you need to get so many people to get the price. So if the public utility spends, you know, $30 million setting this up, and doesn't get enough customers, then you lose your public utility. Oh, it's so it's it would be like a you choose to sign up sort of thing. Yeah. See, I you gotta I think you gotta run it like like public water, like everyone just has it if you're within the city limits or whatever, and you can choose to run your faucet or not, but everyone's in. No, oh, I like that. I mean, I'm sure people get in uproar about taxes then, but. I personally wouldn't. <laughs> I'd be down for it. Yeah, I mean, maybe the maybe I mean the I, I mean a water utility charges you by how much water you use. So if you don't use any, but yeah, check I, the the internet tap to see how much you. Yeah, yeah. right. There's got to be a way to do that. Oh like yeah. My phone oh yeah. Say, internet so. service providers check how much you use because that's another thing with their uh, artificial caps is if you look. Most of them don't enforce it, but you have a limit to how much you can download in a month, Mm. which is ridiculous at this point. But it's precisely because they're trying to, uh, again, with artificial scarcity, keep things like Netflix and other uh, online video, Hulu, uh, that sort of thing, down because most of these are giant cable companies and they want you to pay the cable they want Hmm. you to to buy hbo or whatever from them not not watch it on hulu for you know much cheaper yeah i I never even thought of that as as a reason but yeah totally and since they i mean comcast time warner trying to murder you know Uh that i mean just they have all the market power there then it's it's a really effective, awful monopoly. Yeah. Well, I think that is good coverage for the the wages for Facebook portion of this podcast. Yeah, me too. <laughs> This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.